After months of pressure and moving the goalposts, Germany has finally caved and it's official. The Leopard is going hunting on the killing fields of Ukraine. Joining it are a handful of British challengers and soon nearly three dozen American Abrams, with more likely to come shortly after. The war in Ukraine is heating up as Russia faces the very real possibility of losing against its much smaller neighbor. So how is the Russian Federation going to avoid catastrophic defeat and beat Western tanks? The three tanks being sent, the Leopard 2, Challenger 2, and Abrams, are three of the best tanks in the world, widely considered in fact to be the best three tanks in existence. Each tank has its own strength but all three are formidable challenges to Russia's aging tank forces. The Leopard takes a more middle-of-the-path approach, providing both excellent mobility, protection, and firepower. It's widely seen as the best tank in the West overall right now because of its ease of use and low-cost operation, maintenance, and widespread availability of replacements and replacement parts. In a grinding war of attrition, the Leopard is going to hang around while the other Western models might face a significant challenge with resupply and replenishment. The Leopard is sort of the West's answer to the Soviet Union's philosophy of building a good but not excellent tank in huge numbers. Only the Leopard is built to Western standards and far outstrips any Russian counterpart in capability. The Challenger II is a British-built main battle tank which has never seen a loss in combat to enemy action. When building their own tank, the British decided the best way to win a tank battle was just to outsurvive everyone else. What it might lack in other areas, and it lacks very little, the Challenger makes up for in defense. During character creation, the British put all the Challenger's extra points into armor class, because the Challenger's top secret Chobham, or now Dorchester armor, is unrivaled anywhere in the world. While many Leopards have been lost in combat operations, not a single Challenger was ever destroyed by enemy action. It even outmuscles the American Abrams in weight by around two tons, with its full armor packages installed. Next up in Russia's list of impending headaches is the US Abrams. The tank has a reputation for being as lethal as it is difficult to keep operational. The Abrams shares a lot with the British Challenger in terms of armor. Given that the British and the Americans share the technical challenge of developing new tank armor, its most famous feature might be the inclusion of depleted uranium in both offense and defense. DU armor plating gives the Abrams significant protection at a cost. Many American tankers and even some infantry blame the US government's use of depleted uranium munitions and armor plating for the mysterious Gulf War syndrome that occurred after Desert Storm. Desert Storm is where the Abrams earned its legendary fame, though with, like the Challenger, not a single tank lost to enemy action. This should be of special concern to Russian tankers because the Abrams went up against many of the same tanks Russia is using today and absolutely chewed them to pieces. But America was hesitant to provide Ukraine the Abrams for one very specific reason. It's an absolute bastard about maintenance. Like much American technology, it's extremely capable to the point of science fiction and also a logistics and maintenance nightmare. Instead of a diesel engine, the US installed a gas turbine engine with a monstrous output of 1,500 horsepower. That's well and great given that the latest model Abrams is now so heavy that it can't cross most road bridges, but the engine also requires intense maintenance from specially trained personnel. Ukraine has proven that a farmer with a good knowledge of diesel engines and access to a machine shop can get a Russian tank back in service on the side of the good guys. But that's not going to fly with the Abrams. Because the Americans wanted to be snowflakes, they ditch diesel in favor of what's basically a jet engine. This means that in case of a large-scale war, American tanks couldn't even share fuel with their European counterparts, let alone replacement parts. Not exactly a great strategy in a high-attrition conflict. So how's Russia going to win against Western tanks? Well, Russia's proven to be far from a military strategy genius. But they at least aren't sharing their most confidential strategies with the world. However, we can glean some insights from their past and current behavior as well as common sense. For weeks, Russia's been using largely unsupported infantry assaults across the Eastern Front. Operating a Russian tank anywhere near a Ukrainian position has become a very high-risk activity thanks to the proliferation of Western anti-tank missiles. But many Western observers believe that Russia is consolidating its armored forces and training new batches of tank crews to launch a massive offensive in the next few weeks. By that time, a number of Leopards should be in the country, and it's almost certain that Russia will try to concentrate its armor wherever Western tanks are being used. Right now, about 100 Western tanks have been promised, and Ukraine will likely have about 70 or so of these by late spring. That's entirely too few to conduct large-scope operations with, and Ukraine will be best served by concentrating these numbers into select areas on the battlefield. Russia will likely respond in kind, putting as much firepower as possible directly opposite Ukrainian Leopards and Challenger tanks. One-on-one, -on -one, if both sides have equally trained crews, 
Russian T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s don't stand a chance against the Leopard 2. Most analysts believe that the Leopard will be able to shrug off one or two hits in the same vicinity, especially from the front. Meanwhile, the Leopard's cannon, combined with far superior sensors and fire control computer, will be able to bring the hurt from outside the effective firing ranges of most Russian tanks. Defeating Western tanks will become a numbers game, with Russia flooding the battlefield with its own inferior tanks so it can overwhelm Leopards and Challengers. This strategy is similar to that used in World War II against the Germans by the West, and while it resulted in terrible losses for Western armor, it did work. We can expect similar results in Ukraine due to one simple fact. Ukraine will not be able to use these Western tanks the same way that the West would, and whatever tanks the West sends to Ukraine are going to suffer for it. What do we mean by this? Well, in the West, tanks are meant to operate as parts of combined arms operations, with the support of aerial platforms and precision artillery. This is how the US and its partners defeated Iraq in the first Gulf War, and how the US did it again 10 years later, despite facing a nearly 10 to 1 disadvantage in numbers. The problem for Ukraine is that it cannot match the capabilities of the US and its allies, and it'll be forced to use tanks with far less support than they normally would have. This is the crux of the problem, because as formidable as Western tanks are, and they truly are, there's only so much armor one can put on a vehicle, and it can't be armored equally from all sides. Western armor beats the pants off Russian armor, but physics is still king and one can only push material science so far. Leopards, Abrams, and Challenger tanks will face significant losses in Ukraine, even if operated perfectly by their crews, though the Russians will pay a heavy price for every destroyed Western tank. That's why Russia's best strategy for defeating Western tanks is to prevent them from being supplied at all. It lost the first round of this battle, but it hasn't lost the war. Germany has a little appetite for continuing to send heavy combat equipment to Ukraine, and in fact, its own army is in pretty dire straits. Other countries are more willing, but the fact of the matter is, that the promised 100 tanks for Ukraine are in no way enough. The West needs to commit to the continuous resupply of tanks to Ukraine for the duration of the war to have a real impact, and this is a very dicey proposition. Ukraine fatigue has begun to set in, as well as fears of escalation. Russian disinformation and bluffs have done a great job of either getting Westerners to question support for Ukraine or to be so afraid of, quote, escalation that they refuse to support sending heavy combat equipment. Conspiracy theories about Democrats in the US using the Ukraine war to launder money target the gullible and willing to widen the political divide in the US, while in Germany, Russia beats a never-ending drum of escalation rhetoric to fan fears of a wider conflict. Russia is incapable of widening this conflict, and if it picks a fight with a NATO country, it's basically guaranteeing its own suicide. Using nuclear weapons would have a similar result. And there's always the fact that the West also has its own nukes, and they're probably in better working condition. The truth is, there is no escalation. This is merely rhetoric Putin's intelligence agencies have employed to make Westerners afraid. And it's working, given the massive delays in providing decisive aid to Ukraine. So the best way to beat Western tanks turns out to not be on the battlefield, but on the airwaves. Now go check out why Putin is scared of the West sending tanks to Ukraine, or click this other video instead.